tradition where they go at midnight and they open the front door. That's to let the old year out and the new year in. I thought that was pretty cool. So then the other thing I saw was, and I'd like you all to do that if you're up at midnight holding that door open, hang on to that knob and pick up your left foot. And that way, we can start the year on the right foot. <laughs> just a little wisdom from Facebook. I'd just share that with you. Please fill out the register and pass it back. Um, next Saturday morning is Huddle for Men, guys. Please uh, make arrangements to come. It's a great time to get together and visit with the guys, have a little breakfast, a little fellowship, a little devotion time. Um, just a good time to come together. 7.30 on next Saturday morning. There is no Tuesday and Wednesday night Bible study this week. And the other thing for you to think about is uh, January 17th will be our annual business meeting. Uh, please come and, and see what we've done this last year and make plans for next year. I think that's all there is. The so year. if you, the yeah, year. we're gonna, yeah, that's it for the year. So let's turn in our bulletin to the call to worship and let's read that together. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and great to be praised. He is Very good. Well, it's loud. That means you can hear me now, isn't it? It's not good. <laughs> well, it's great you're here, and like this is uh, this is the last uh, last Sunday of the year. That's crazy, and it? it won't be long, and it'll be May Day. <laughs> I, I'm hoping. <laughs> I know, and I'm hoping it's warm. I don't care what day. Anyway, it was your, it's, uh, it's time, to, we're going to sing some here, and we're going to sing Praise Him, Praise Him, and that is in uh, your hymnal on uh, 106. So, but stand with me and sing that one, and people have thoughtfully put it on the wall for you.
pray. I did forget one important thing, and that's Don's charge for the week. Donna has a birthday this week, so make sure you call her, would you? <laughs> Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we just come before you this last day of the year. As we exit this year and start a new year, Lord, we look for your wisdom, your guidance, and, and your care. We just thank you for all that you do for us. Bless each and every one of us today and tomorrow and, and through this coming year that we can glorify you in all that we say and we do. We just thank you for all that are here today to hear your word and, and to fellowship together. We pray this in the name of him who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. We'll sing hymn number 72 and hymn number 92 in your hymnals if you want to follow there. And we'll sing those together. Just remain seated. Reason. 
restored in thee change from glory into glory Well, good morning, everyone. Should I say Happy New Year? It's not quite time for that, is it? Happy Old Year, because this is the last day of, of the 2023. Are you happy about that by any chance? Yeah, it's kind of like, oh, finally, we got to the end of it. Um, before we go to prayer, I just have a couple quick things I want to say. Thank you very much. Last week, we were given a gift from the church. It was very generous, and we really do appreciate that. Uh, it's, it'll help, and uh, it's just the satisfaction of uh, you know, being appreciated. Thank you for that. And the other thing, um, the reason we're not having meetings on Tuesday and Wednesday this week is because I'm going to be going up to Kansas City to St. Luke's Hospital. I don't think it's anything serious, but a couple, few months ago, a doctor did a test on my heart and said, oh, we need to do another test. So... We'll see what's going on. Probably nothing serious, but we're going to go up and I'm not going to be in any shape on Wednesday to come back and do much because i got to take a... I'm, they're putting me in an MRI and those things... I have claustrophobia, so they give you drugs. <laughs> they mess you up pretty good, I think. Yeah. So anyway, pray for me. I'd appreciate that. <laughs> Hope the, the medicine works. Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, we do thank you. Thank you for the promises that you have given us, for the new life that we have in you. And when we think of, of the last verse of this song that we sang, when we will come before your throne, we'll leave this world behind and we'll be before you singing hallelujah, praising your name, when all the work, work and the worries and the concerns that we have in this life will be finished and there will be nothing but pure joy before us. Thank you for the challenges that you give us in this life and for the power that you give us to deal with them in your, in your name through your Holy Spirit working in us. We rejoice in that. Lord, as we look around the world, we think of our brothers and sisters, part of the body of Jesus Christ in Nigeria, which has suffered a serious blow this last week as some people of another religion attacked and killed over 100 Nigerian believers. They're in a hard place, Lord, with Christians to the south and Muslims to the north, and they are in the middle, and uh, they're trying to be squelched. Their homes were destroyed, and they've lost their lives. We pray for the families of those who have lost loved ones, and we pray for the Christians who are there. May they be strong, Lord. May they not be intimidated in any way by this going on, and by their, by their love and by their courage in you. May those who want to persecute them see that you are the true God, and may they turn from their ways and turn to you. We thank you for this. We think of our own nation, and our leadership, and problems that we have in many places. We ask for your blessing there. We ask that you would guide us in the path of truth, and may justice come out. We thank you for that too, Lord. We think of Vern's friend, Pam, with uh, pancreatic cancer that has spread to her bones. It's usually not a good sign. We pray that you would encourage her in these days, and if there is treatments that she can take, that they would help to extend her life and give her some joy and peace in the days ahead. And Lord, we trust that she is ready to meet you. Thank you for Charles and Susan and how you've blessed them over the years, and even in these days of challenge, help them. Help Charles to have peace and to be calm and, and to not be bothered by things that aren't really an issue at all, and be with Susan as she takes care of him. Encourage her and give her health. Thank you for Maya, who's doing so well, Mark's great-granddaughter. We, we rejoice that she is just so precious, and she's in ICU yet, but she is thriving. Continue to bless her. And Matt, Paula's daughter's brother-in-law, continue to help him too, and help him um, in every way, not just physically right now, but in long-term life issues. 
guide him and direct him. And Roger, we thank you that he is doing so much better. May he continue to have a regular heartbeat. And Janice, Chris's friend, we lift her before you and her recent setback. We pray for Jasper, encourage him and strengthen him and give him peace and direction. And Sue, as she's in therapy now in Mercy Hospital, may it go well with her and may she heal well. This fracture in her bone, may it mend and just be with her in every way. Be with Lisa, continue to help her in her Omega House and the ministry that she has there with these women. Um, help her to be a good example to them. And Lord, there are times probably when she doesn't know just exactly what she needs to say in certain situations, but give her wisdom and just give her the words, and we thank you for it. Continue to bless the work of the Omega Project here in McPherson and other places where they are. Um, bless their ongoing ministry. Thank you for the deep down good work that they are doing. Be with Vern as he struggles with cancer and also the back pain. Bless him and give him wisdom and strength. And Jennifer, too, as she stands beside him. And be with Gloria. Give her strength and joy. And Jerry, as she continues to recover, uh, give her direction in the future, too, and peace about it all. Thank you for how you have blessed her in these days. And Karen and her special request. And Shauna, um, thank you that her cancer treatments are going well and the energy is increasing. Continue to bless her, we pray. And Jerry, Chris's sister, and all that she's going through. And Chris as well, as she's recently moved, bless her and help her as she gets settled there. And we thank you for it. And Lord, you know our hearts and our minds, our spirits. We, we lift our request before you now. Thank you for hearing and answering. In Jesus' name, amen. Remain seated. We'll sing hymn number 25, in, in, uh, Immortal Invisible is the name of this one. So sing that one together. Time to worship the Lord in giving. And the passage I'd like to call your attention to is uh, Psalm, uh, Proverbs 11, verses 24 and 25. One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Ushers, would you come forward, please? Heavenly Father, we do thank you for 
your blessings to us and for the joy of, of giving, Lord, and how we are refreshed as we refresh others. I pray that you would bless this act of worship. May it be to your glory and to our good as you work in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand. seated except for children young people come on up front got a little message for you thanks for coming here comes Sydney too good hi there <laughs> she always smiles real big at me but then she goes like this and runs away <laughs> I'm used to it though that's what girls do around me <laughs> Fortunately, I'm married and I don't have to worry about it anymore. <laughs> okay, well, this is the end of the year, right? Coming up on it here pretty fast. Takes me a minute to get organized. I got a, a lot of stuff to pull off here. Okay. All righty. Now, today, we'll step over here. I want to talk to you about what you build your life on. And this is the change of the year, and it's a time when we all kind of get a little introspective, and we think about what's important, we think about the last year, and what we might do different in the coming year. Um, so when we, when we make decisions about our lives, we're actually deciding what kind of wisdom we're going to follow. And there's the wisdom of the world, and there's the wisdom of the Bible. For instance, the world says, if your teacher says something that you don't want to hear, don't listen. You don't have to. <laughs> right? Okay. The wisdom of the world says, if someone hurts you, then pay them back and do it double. Make them really hurt back. Or the wisdom of the world says, it's hard to tell the truth sometimes. And in those cases, you don't need to. Just lie. Nobody will know the difference. <laughs> or um, the, world, the wisdom of the world says, if you really want something, just go ahead and take it. And we build a foundation in our lives based on the wisdom that we listen to. Come on up. Yeah, you're doing good. Come on, there's room for you right here. Okay, so this is your foundation that you've laid, and this is life. And life comes at you, and it 
Sometimes it's challenging. Let's see how well that foundation holds. Uh, not so well. Okay. Well, we should build our lives on the wisdom that God gives us. And that wisdom says, um, you know, if the teacher's talking to you and you don't like what she's saying, you better listen anyway. Because the Bible says, listen to your parents and obey them and also those who are in authority over you. Because God has established authority. It's from him. Or when someone hurts you, pay him back double. Instead of that one, the Bible says, turn the other cheek. That's not an easy thing to do always. But we are to be gentle with others, even when they hurt us. Or the telling the truth one. If it's hard to tell the truth, tell the truth anyway. <laughs> it's one of the Ten Commandments. Don't bear false witness, which means don't say things that aren't true. Tell the truth. Um, and then the one that says, if you really want something, just take it. Well, the Bible says, don't be envious of other people and what they have. Be satisfied with what you have and be thankful to God for what you have. Some other wisdom from God is um, pray for those who hurt you. Not only don't punch them back, but pray for them and ask God to bless them and help them. And let's see, there's probably one more here that we should think about. Uh, do unto others as you want others to do unto you. The golden rule. Okay, so that's the foundation that God gives us in his word. So we're building our life on that foundation. Let's see how it does when the weight of the world comes down on it. Look at that. It holds firm. Okay, so... That's the wisdom we need to be building our lives on. And, and, you know, those are examples I gave you, but there are other ways that life comes at you too. So you just need to continue to trust God. Let's pray, shall we? Thank you, Lord, for your blessings. Thank you for the wisdom that you give us. And you give it to us at all stages of our lives, whether we're just little, little people toddling around or in elementary school or middle school or high school or college or adults or beyond, Lord. Help us to grasp your wisdom and to build our lives on it. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, thanks for coming up. <laughs> Good having you all up here today. <laughs> well, I'm going to do something a little different today than I've ever, ever done here before. I changed the sermon that I planned to give. And so what's in your bulletin is not what you're going to get today. Uh, I can do that now and then, I think. <laughs> uh, it's the end of the year, right? And uh, so I thought I needed to say something about the end of the year. So I was going to incorporate that into what I had already planned. And it turned out to be two sermons, and it was just too much to get in in 20 or 25 minutes. And so I broke it in two, and you'll get the other part next week. So today, the text that I want to read from is found in Ecclesiastes. It's chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 11. And I'm not sure how familiar you are with Ecclesiastes, but it's, uh, you know, if you're feeling discouraged and you want some uh, misery loves company, you know, if you want some from comfort for your soul, read Ecclesiastes because he just goes on and on about how meaningless everything is. But then he concludes with, yes, it's meaningless apart from God. And that's what gives us meaning. And so we can glean that. But let's read what it says there in chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. Would you stand as I read? There is a time for everything, and a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. 
a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What do workers gain from their toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. You may be seated. So here we are, the last Sunday of 2023, in the last month of 2023. When you wake up in the morning, it'll be 2024, I mean the new year. In fact, already in Japan, it's the new year. It's about 2.30 a.m., really, really early, Monday morning there. Somehow to me, finishing up what you've been doing and beginning something new feels good. Whether it's been a good year or a hard year, it's good to wrap it up and to start over next year with a fresh new year. We as human beings were created to do well in cycles and in seasons. For instance, we have 24 hours a day, every day. A part of that is for sleep and the rest of it is for being awake. We have seven days a week, Six of those days, you can do your regular work. On the seventh day, you rest and you worship and you rejuvenate. We have the four seasons, spring when everything seems to be coming back to life, and then summer when the days are long and full, and then the fall when the leaves begin to turn brown and drop to the ground, and then winter when we slow down and just try to keep warm. And then it starts all over again with spring. Well, here's a riddle for you. What goes on four legs in the morning, two legs in the afternoon, and three legs in the evening? Have you heard this one before? Cinnamon knows. It's from literature. It's the Sphinx riddle that he gave to Odysseus. And if you answer it wrong, he eats you in the book. (laughs) And Odysseus answered it correctly, and it is a person. When a person is a baby, they crawl on all four. Then when they become an adult, they walk on their two legs. And then as they get older and have a harder time walking, they use a walking stick, and so they walk on three legs. We people have seasons as well. And God's work in creation also has seasons from the beginning of time until the consummation of the kingdom of heaven. First, he created everything, and he formed man and woman, and he gave them free will, and he even allowed them to rebel against him and sin, which they did, and that brought death to everyone, which is what God had warned them would happen. And then those early human beings multiplied, and the greatness that God had put inside of the human being became great evil. So God sent a flood to wipe out almost everybody in that first wave of population. Then out of the flood, Noah and his family survived, and they began to reproduce again, and the population of the world grew again. And then God chose one man, Abraham, who was a man of faith, to be the one that he would build a nation through. And he grew into the nation of Israel. They were given God's commandments Those are good commandments that when followed, they bring prosperity, health, and good relationship to God. But, as you know, they failed, and they ended up being scattered among many nations. And even the place where they worshipped God was destroyed, so they could no longer offer sacrifices. It was a season of God. And yet God had another season planned, and that was the season when he would enter the world himself as a man, just like the one, those, the ones that he had created. <clears throat> but he would live perfectly, following the laws as no other could. And he would conquer evil and corruption and topple wicked leaders and foolish people. He came as the Lion of Judah, the mighty king. 
end. He conquered by being unjustly put to death. That doesn't make sense on the surface, does it? I had a teacher in high school that talked about a fight that he had when he was younger. And he said, first, I punched the guy in the fist with my stomach. <laughs> and then I punched him in the fist again with my jaw. <laughs> and I showed him. Well, you know, winning by losing. It worked for the teacher, and it was really a joke, I think. I don't, <laughs> I don't think he was serious. But he was a teacher you can never tell. No, Jesus conquering by dying doesn't make sense in a worldly way of thinking. If you're going to conquer, you have to be strong and powerful. You must meet all challenges with superior strength. You must not bow down. You must keep your head high. That's worldly wisdom. But that's not what Jesus did. In the book of Revelation, John saw visions of heaven shown to him by an angel. And he heard from Jesus. And as John was in this vision, he was before the throne of God, and there were the 24 elders around him, and there, were, there was one of them who said, Behold the lamb, no, he said, Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. That's what John heard. And so when John went to look to, to behold, he didn't see a lion. He saw a lamb that looked like it had been slain. The lion of Judah was a lamb that was slain. Somehow, when he looked at this, this symbol of Jesus, it was a lamb and it had been slain. In the days when they did sacrifices, they would take the lamb and they would slice its throat and allow the blood to drain out. And somehow that's what John saw when he looked at the lion of Judah. Now you have to understand that John's vision in Revelation had a lot of powerful symbolism. It was used to communicate. So Jesus isn't literally a lion, nor is he literally a lamb. He is God, an eternal spiritual being who became man, God and man together. So now he has a human body like ours, only it is a glorified body. It can live in heaven while we cannot in our physical bodies. Jesus has all power and authority. But I've always wondered, since I went to Sunday school as a little boy and heard this, why did Jesus have to die? Why couldn't he have just gotten rid of the devil and then just declared us free of sin? Just because he's God. He can do anything. Why didn't he just do that? It would have been a lot simpler solution than him coming to earth, suffering and dying on the cross, being raised, raised again, that's glorious, and going to heaven, yes, and then us having to go through a pilgrimage here where when we turn to him and have our sins taken away, we still have to endure because the devil is trying to stop us. And it's a struggle. And, you know, it would have been easier if he had just taken us all to heaven right then. It would have been great, in fact. Well, here's why Jesus conquered by dying. At least my understanding of it. And I think it's biblical. It was the only way that he could accomplish his purpose in this world. And that purpose is to have a beautiful world filled with people who love him and who love each other, and they do it from their heart. People who are fully free and yet choose to follow him. Not people who obey out of fear of punishment or because of legalism or because they are forced to, but people who follow him because they know what it is like to be guilty of sin deserving of death and yet then to be forgiven and made 100% pure and righteous before God. And the only way for him to accomplish that purpose was to do exactly what he did, to make the world a good place for people to thrive, but knowing that they would rebel and mess it up. And since they were like that, then since we are like that, we've messed up and we've rebelled, we have sinned, but we are saved by him. And that puts us into a position of eternal debt, of gratitude to him and dedication. And that's what he wants. He wants us to be grateful and to be dedicated to him out of a willing heart. As for his glory, yes, definitely, for his glory. We're created for his glory. He, God is not an egomaniac 
wanting glory because he's God. He deserves glory, but it is also for our good. We are most blessed, most joyful, most at peace, most where we really need to be when we are in that position with God here on earth and as we will be in heaven. <clears throat> we humans who have been redeemed by Jesus can know things that angels just don't get. Angels are above us in created order. They're spiritual beings, you know, and if God gave them permission, they could zap us and we'd turn into a poof of flame and be gone. They, under, they obey God. They're under him, but they're over us. But we have the privilege of experiencing sin and redemption, and we understand it at a heart level, but they don't get it. It's exactly because we are born fallen people and saved by Jesus. The sin has been blotted out and we are made righteous in his sight. But the only way for us to be made righteous in his sight is by letting go of our own way of doing things. We have to let go of our own way of judging good and evil. And we have to trust his way that's written in the word. What was the fruit? What was the tree that Adam and Eve weren't supposed to eat of? It was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God said, let me teach you what that is. You don't need to figure that out yourself. Trust me. When we trust him, what is good and evil, as we learn it in his word, then we're on the right track. Because we were all born evil. We tend towards sin. Our bias is to go into sin. And our pride is part of that. And in our pride, we want to be deserving of eternal life. So Jesus has come, let me help you. And too many times we say, no, thank you. I got this. I can do it on my own. See how good I am? Now, when you judge me, you'll see that I really do deserve heaven. But that's not the way it works. We have to let him do it for us and in us. Then when he has changed us, we begin to live the way he wants us to here and now in this world. We've become citizens of his kingdom, but we are still living in this world for now. So the season of God's work on earth that we now live in is called the church age or the age of grace or the season of grace. It's a time when people from all over the world can repent of their sins and come to God through Jesus Christ and be forgiven completely. When people do that, they become part of the church with a capital C, church the body of Jesus Christ on earth. Now, there's a text I want to read to you, and it's speaking about the Christians in the world. It's from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. It says, Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is part of it. Jesus is the head, and the body is us, the church, the believers in Jesus Christ. Let me ask you this. How many churches are there in McPherson? Pretty godly little town. <laughs> For the most part. 10? No, more than that. 20? 40? The answer is, it's a trick question, just one. <laughs> All the believers in Jesus Christ. Now, we meet in different groups in different places, and we maybe have different styles of worship, worship but we are, we are just one church in McPherson, and one church in the world. That's why we pray for people in Nigeria, because they're just as much a part of the body as we are. We don't know their names, but we know they are brothers and sisters in Christ. That's the world we live in. It isn't perfect, but it is part of God's plan for this season of his kingdom. I heard this from another preacher, and he said there was an article a few years ago in which a man gave an idea of what the perfect world would look like. He said, in a perfect world, you would feel as good at 60 as you did at 17. And you would be as smart at 60 as you thought you were at 17. <laughs> in a perfect world, professional basketball, baseball, and football players would be complaining because school teachers were signing multi-million dollar contracts. In a perfect world, potato chips would have calories, but if eaten with dip, the calories would be neutralized. <laughs> in a perfect world, mail would always be early, and the check in the mail would always be for more than you expected it. 
The truth is, though, that this is not a perfect world, and this world as it is now never will be. This past year, a man by the name of John Goodenough passed away at the age of 97. Now, you may not know his name, but you have, does anybody know John Goodenough? Know who he is? Okay. But you have certainly benefited from what he did in his life. You probably carry something in your pocket or your purse right now that exists because of John Goodenough. In 2017, John Goodenough received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. What John Goodenough did was invent the lithium battery. It's a super efficient way of storing power in a small size, unknown before his time. Can you imagine having a cell phone with one of those old six volt batteries like you used to have to buy for science projects? That's about what it would take. You know, your pocket, I have a phone in my pocket right now, it'd be bulging out really big with a battery like that. But because of what John Goodenough invented, it's just a slim little, little card like that we put in the phone. John Goodenough was also a strong Christian. He lived in this world and made it a better place, but he lived in light of eternity. And his motto was, help us, O Lord, so long as we live, to live nobly and to the good cheer of our fellow man and woman, I would add, fellow person. That's what he meant, human beings. Help us, O Lord, so long as we live, to live nobly and to the good cheer of our fellow man. To live nobly, we need to keep our minds and our hearts stayed on Jesus every day. We do this by thanking God every day for what he's done for us, what you have, what he's doing in people around you. And I think it's a good practice, and I encourage you all to just commit to doing this. Every morning when you get up, first thing, you thank God for 10 things. Find 10 things that you're thankful for. And they can be really deep, like the amazing grace of God, which transformed a sinner like me. Or it could be, thanks for this cup of coffee, Lord, I need it. Whatever. And keep count on your fingers. You can do that. And, and I suggest maybe a good place to do it. Do it out loud. Thank you, God. And maybe you want to do it in the bathroom. I, I don't know. But wherever you want to do it, be thankful, first thing. And then sometime during the day, preferably in the morning, but anytime works, pray about your day. Pray for the people in your family, the people in the church here, people you know that are in a hard place, maybe colleagues at work or wherever or people that you just want God to bless. It doesn't need to take a long time, maybe even just a few minutes. And then sometime in the, and then sometime in the day, preferably in the morning, I think, read the Bible. Now, there are two Bible reading plans on the table in the lobby there, and I want to explain them, but they're real simple. I'm going to use one of them this year. The first one is the reading plan to read the whole Bible in a year. And the way it works, it has scripture from four different books each week. Matthew, Acts, Psalms, and Genesis starts out the first week. You read five times in a week. You don't need to read seven days, just five days. And if you, you know, miss a day, then you can catch it up before the week is out. And if you get them all done by Friday, you can read more. You can read something that you read earlier and wanted to think some more about. One of them takes 15 to 30 minutes a day to read. And it'll get you through the whole Bible in a year. And the other one, five plus five plus five, five minutes a day, five days a week, and then they've got five questions that you can answer to help you think about it. And it will get you through the New Testament in a year. You just read one chapter a day. One of those I encourage you to pick up and take home, put in your Bible, and just read through either the New Testament or the whole Bible this coming year. And also, for those of you who are really free spirits, this is a chart of all the books in the Bible and all the chapters, and you can just read whatever ones you want and just check them off on here and make sure by the end of the year they're done if you're really, you know, into that kind of approach. So tomorrow is January 1st, 2024. It's the beginning of a new season for us. Let's make the most of it that we can. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the seasons that you've given us to live in, 
how that just works with our internal clock. Our bodies were made to thrive in this environment and our spirits and our minds too. Thank you for that. But Lord, we also thank you for the seasons of your kingdom work in this world and how you brought us in at this time. This is a great time in church history and world history to be your child. We have Jesus. We have the Bible and all of its fullness and the truth that it brings to us. And we can trust in you. And the times are perilous, but Lord, you are with us in them. We thank you for that. Help us to keep our minds and our hearts stayed on you every day. Be with each of us here, Lord, and challenge us in that way. And help us to start out tomorrow doing it and to just continue on until December 31st, 2024. Well, thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good luck with your deal this week. We'll be, uh, that you're going to have scoped out, checked out. So we'll be praying for you. Is that right this coming yeah. week? Yes, Wednesday morning. All right, very good. Well, he'll be fine. <laughs> he'll be, no worries. We'll be praying for you. And thank you for being here. Uh, my, we'll see you next year, uh, I guess. We'll come back a week from the day. So that's perfect. Thanks, Marie, for playing for us, too. We'll stand and sing Lavish Love, Abundant Beauty. That's in your hymnal on page 61. So stand with me and sing that. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you henceforth throughout the coming year and forever. Amen.